This portion of the CU podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Attention listeners across the galaxy, all the way from Australia to Houston. Do we have a pew problem? If so, our friends at Manscaped have cleared you for takeoff with their fourth generation and brand new lawnmower 4.0. Kick your pubes to the next planet with the performance package 4.0. The orbits in your pants will feel like you're in zero gravity when you use the best tools for, for the job from the leaders in male grooming. Join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get your rocket ready for takeoff by going to manscaped.com slash CU podcast for 20% off plus free shipping, Ian. Ready for an out of this world experience, fellas? Look no further than the performance package 4.0 from Manscaped that has just taken off in not only the USA, but Canada, the UK, across Europe, Australia, South Africa, and Singapore. Inside the package, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver ball deodorant, crop reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold your whole solar system. First scheduled for liftoff is the new Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. This spaceship is here to guide you on a journey to trim your body, balls, butt, and even your anus. Oh! oh! The Lawnmower 4.0 also has a 4000K LED spotlight you can turn on and off when needed for a more precise shave throughout your travels across the universe. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker. It's like having a little astronaut to chop your worst weeds up top in your nose and ear. Don't forget to use Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and their Crop Reviver to help your little planets be on their A-game while feeling the sun's heat. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Abort Harry Balls and Buzz Lightyear that Woody with Manscaped. If you're ready for your adventure with Manscaped, get 20% off plus free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash CU podcast. That's 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash CU podcast for a clean Trinity and beyond your space balls. will thank you. <laughs> All right, Ian, Pat, are your games worth millions? Oh, what are we doing? <laughs> so we knew that with the recent headlines, uh, with the million dollar game sales. Now it's like every week you had the $1.5 million Mario 64 via heritage auctions. It seems like a year and a half ago, but it was like a month. Um, and then you had the, the $2 million, not even first print run or second print run Super Mario brothers sold to, uh, from the rally app to, to a private party, but rally investors were involved with that for 2 million, a sealed Super Mario brothers. You're going to have mainstream notice. Uh, and articles now. This happened with the Yahoo. The quaint times in 2009, Ian, with a, with a $10,000 Steam events found in the yeah. fucking eBay auction or someone's fucking closet. So this you happens know, a lot. 2009, 10. And I, the problem when, when the mainstream gets a hold of shit like this is they uh, almost always paint with far too broad of a brush. Um, they talk about, you know, how someone found that stadium events in a closet, or they talk about the, uh, very strange Super Mario 64 auction. Um, and they, they talk in such a way that is meant to get you excited, uh, and think that everyone out there is sitting on, um, millions of, of dollars. And, and, and more often than not, you are not. Um, one thing that has changed since, you know, the stadium events days into now is that we are seeing things go for an insane amount of money, just more money than we thought they would ever go for. But even then, the likelihood that you are sitting on something like that is still very slim. But here's the weird part that's changed a little bit. Back in the stadium events days, they were legitimately rare games. Yes, exactly. So, like... This article, while still this is this article is on CNN styled by uh, Megan Hills, and we're not gonna I'm not gonna kill you, Megan. This isn't your thing, but we're gonna go into this article a little bit. But now there's a grain of truth to it, right? Because now you probably don't have a you know a, a complete in box stay events laying around. You might have a sealed Super Mario 64. That's not insane to think about. Yes. Someone having one. People have sealed games, and, and I, I've seen yeah. some people be like, "Really?" You, you... Or Look, people might have like this is why it's insane now because now on my shelf. That complete embossed Legend of Zelda goes for over a grand. You have that sitting around now, right? You have that's not what it was, but you, you have stuff that was three four years ago. Well, does it go for over a grand, or does it go for over a grand if you put it in a plastic box that you have to well, pay for? Either way, a first print run Legend of Zelda, yes. even not sealed, is now going. And my Tyson punch, they're going for over a thousand dollars. Contra, like you have these games laying around now, right? So it's, it's closer to truth. So this uh, is from uh, this is CNN style. Um, 
They talked to someone named Roberto Dillon, began collecting retro games more than 12 years ago. In 2009, he scoured auction sites and connected with niche groups of hobbyists to amass a personal archive that is now hundreds of titles strong. But at the time, there was a consensus among collectors that buying old games was sort of a fad, said the academic game developer. And in the grand scheme of things, yes, video game collecting was like a niche thing, even amongst other collectibles. It's like, you know, it's not the biggest thing. It's not baseball cards. It's not comic books. There's not, you're not going to have, you know, 100,000 people go to a, you know, a, a, a retro gaming convention. The biggest convention uh, back then, uh, in 2009-10, uh, you know, uh, PRGE, the first one I went to was 2010-11. It was only hundreds of people. It wasn't thousands even yet. It was still on the cusp of blowing up. So, you know, it, it was still, that, that's correct. It was sort of a, 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 I wouldn't say fad because it, we're still collecting games, but it was very niche amongst collectibles. It was. Yeah. You know, um, most collectors were simply nostalgic for the childhood games. Uh, Dylan explained in a video interview, there was no idea that games could become artifacts of the past that, w- that we want to conserve and preserve. Preserve. No, there was. There, there was. There were people that were thinking about that even back then. Yes, absolutely. That, that's where I think, uh, I'm not trying to kill, kill this person doing this interview, but no, there were people thinking about that. There was always people that thinking we have to start co- collating this stuff. Remember, the original ar- archives and preservations were collectors. We have to collate this shit and know what we have and document it. That, that's that been happening forever. Sure. That's been happening since the first run of collectors from, from the Atari era. Started really probably doing it in like the late 80s to 90s. Started to really get into it. Um, so they talk about the, the $2 million Super Mario Brothers, the $1.5 million 64, the $870,000 Legend of Zelda, which is insane on its... Uh, it's insane by itself. Um, uh, cultural Artifacts. Collecting is not just Dylan's hobby, it's also part of his job. He's the founder and creator of Singapore's James Cook University Museum of Video and Computer Games. Huh, so in Singapore they have a little museum there. It was charged the sector's evolution through a 400-strong collection of game memorabilia. Retro video games have become uh, a kind of modern relic, Dylan said, one intertwined with nostalgia, pop culture, and technological history. Well, I agree with that. They really show us how technology evolves with the kinds of tastes we have had years of gaming. Um, so... He talks about how the, these are holy grails or unopened, shrink wrapped early editions of iconic titles. They're, but here's the thing, though: they never were holy grails to to ninety nine point nine percent of collectors. They weren't, and that's what I, I got into arguments with people about in person. People that are pumping up this sector, and now you see the results of them pumping it up. Is that the holy grails of game collecting were never ever sealed games? They no. never were. They were rare and obscure artifacts. They were things that were legitimately legitimately hard to find. Stadium events, NWC cards, Mr. Boston, uh, you know, Vectrex game. Test cartridges, prototypes. Pepsi Man, or Pepsi, Pepsi Invaders, or whatever yeah. the fuck it was on the Atari. Chase the Chuck Wagon. Stuff that were like weird giveaways. Stuff yeah. that were that were mail-aways. Stuff that were just, you know, hard to get. Yeah. Uh, I got something hearing you? No, that was scratching. Me. Okay. <laughs> that was me scratching me. It were th- oddities that weren't readily available in any other form. That's what they were. If you want to say stuff, even like some of the hardware stuff, like, I don't know, it's not incredibly, incredibly hard to find, but the, you know, the Vectrex 3D imager, it's, it, you know, they're not easy to come by, weird stuff like that. Stuff that really, w- when you boil down to it, these are things that would be interesting to people, to the, I think to the average person to learn about. These would be things that, oh, I could read about this now. Oh, it, you can put it on display. You can, you can put, you know, the uh, Vectrex Mr. Boston on display. I'm like, oh, this was just a giveaway that, that Mr. Boston commissioned for their employees back in like whatever it was, 83, 84. There's like only a couple hundred of these things made or a few hundred. That's an interesting piece of history. A game that pre-exists in another form that now is just cellophane wrapped, that's not an interesting story at all. No. It's the same commercial product, just unwrapped. That's all it is. Right. That's where I wholeheartedly disagree with this, and I disagreed with back on a, on a Nintendo Age, my favorite website back in 10, 12 years ago. Man, how long has it been since that place fell apart? When Go Collect bought them out, it was, uh, I think, or it was 2019, all that stuff happened. Wow. When, when that guy bought out Dane Anderson, the guy who ran us, he bought out, the, he bought out Dane Anderson's collection. Right. No, it was Dane. so long ago. It, it, it's two and a half years only. It feels like forever. Yeah, it does. It feels like forever. They've done a lot in two and a half years, these folks. Um, according to... Ileana Bodner Horvath, head of marketing at, at luxury collectible auctioner Macy and Sons. Interest in retro video games reflects online investors' growing appetite for non-traditional assets such as sneakers, trading cards, 
and NFTs. You know what, Ileana? You're right. That's actually a pretty, for not probably having dealt with video games, that's a pretty astute observation. That's where probably a chunk of this money has come from recently. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's it's another sort of collectible. I can dabble in the market. I could I could uh, speculate. I could gamble in a way. And it's video games, so it's interesting at the same time. Yeah, everything is just falling under the umbrella of collectibles now. Yeah, it's it's an investment collectible. Recently, we have seen a surge in more eclectic requests from our clients looking for unique and rare collectibles. She said over email adding, we believe people will always invest in traditional assets such as stocks and real estate, but alternative assets are exactly that. She's absolutely right. From what I hear, there are people that were traditional investors and people with money that all of a sudden are like, hey, uh, I want a rare, a rare video games. I want an NWC cart. These people did, probably didn't know what an NWC cart was three, four years ago. Sure. They did probably no idea. Now they hear about it. It's a buzz thing. It's like, I want to be in this. I want to be in this sector, Ian. I, I want to be my, in this space. I have my real estate investments. Now I have my video game investments. The collectible space. Yes. Um, rather than games with limited production runs, it is classic titles from the most popular franchises that attract the highest bids, which we talked about how that's kind of weird. Dylan said that it's maybe partly because new collectors are more willing to invest in well-known characters that appeal to their sense of nostalgia, such as Mario, Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII, or Zelda protagonist Link. It's not just nostalgia. They are treating this like other collectibles, like comic books. They're treating it as, well, the most popular characters are the, are the ones that end up being worth the most money. Even if a comic is rare, if it doesn't have a big name attached to it, like a, a primary superhero, then it's not worth as much in the grand scheme of things. But that's where they are, I think, off long term. Because in this case, the, these, these characters are popular because they're ubiquitous and there's tons of these games that exist. And in some of these cases of sealed games like Mario 64, there's a lot of sealed versions of Mario 64 that even exist. Sure. So this is where long term, they're in for a very rude awakening. The same rude awakening that we're already seeing with the, the Spider-Man Atari 2600 games go from nine grand to 900 in only like a year. Because you yeah. realize, hey, it's a popular character, but most people don't care because there's a lot of these out there. And it's not that important of a game on top of that in the grand scheme of things. So, um, yeah. The July sale generated eight point four million. By the way, that that one, eight point four million dollars. And remember, twenty percent of that goes to Heritage. We're talking a lot of money they made. They made a couple of million dollars. Pat Math Heritage directly on that on that one auction. That's not counting if they're taking a cut from the seller. That's just with the buyer's premium. Two million dollars Heritage auctions made. Th three years ago, they weren't making any money off video games. Heritage auctions. Now they're making $2 million in, in a weekend. It's a lot of money at stake here. There, there's some factors at work here. There absolutely is. Um, the future of collecting. You want to comment on that? Uh, with games, uh, today's games industry moving towards digital-only sales, either via third-party platforms like Steam or directly through PlayStation Network and Nintendo Direct, owning physical games may eventually become a thing of the past. That is correct uh, overall. Uh, but game developers already have one eye on the next generation of nostalgic investors. This is where you might disagree, Ian. Some have created digital collector's editions containing exclusive artwork, soundtracks, or add-ons. Others are sprucing up their physical offerings. Oh, God, Ian, you're going to kill this. Ubisoft offering a really recently released an $800 legendary edition of the game Assassin's Creed Origins, which includes a 29-inch tall resin statue of its main character. Lithograph signed by a studio artist and a hand-drawn world map, among other collectibles. Fewer than 1,000 copies were released worldwide. So they're trying to tap into this. They're thinking the future, Ian, 20 years from now, on Harris Auctions, you're going to see this legendary edition auctioned off. No. I just don't. I mean, sure, there, and people can, and they probably will, they'll point to things that do appreciate and value from these collector's editions or things that do, but, that do hold a value. But overall... This is just junk that ends up taking up space in people's houses and they go, why did I buy this? And then they can't get rid of it because no one else wants it taking up their space. So you don't think there's like a 15 year old now that once they're in their 40s would want to invest potentially in the this legendary edition the same way people are investing now in Mario 64? No, I, I don't. You I, guess, I don't think it's the same. It's 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 because it's not the game. It's merchandise. Well, the game's there, but you're getting the shit that. Yeah, I, it's not the same. It's oh, not we'll at see. all the same. We'll be doing the podcast at 75 years old. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know what happens when that when that occurs there. No but they're trying to they're trying to well, at least well, at least if it's a thousand, that's at least more limited than like oh get the Joker statue in this sure. Batman arc where they make like 150 thousand of the damn thing for right. 200 thousand. Uh, digital collector's editions that's just silly. That's just silly. We know that the NFT stuff is already falling apart. 
uh, th that world for the most part from what we know. That's just silly. But in, but but in television. Well, yeah, yeah, they're NFTs. Yeah, well, you know, they got the cutting edge tech according to CEO Tommy Tallarico. But anyway, so it's an, it's an interesting read. There's some good stuff in here. Uh, there's stuff I disagree with. There's some stuff I agree with. But again, these writers, you know, the C the CNN style writer. What does that do with style, by the way? I don't know. The CNN style writers probably said, "All right, find out about video games. Go." Goes, oh, okay, boss. Gets gets on their their little reporter notepad and pencil and starts interviewing people. And, and you know, there's some good info in these articles. Sometimes they're not, but overall, your old video games are not worth millions of dollars. But damned if we're not going to hear a couple people say, "Oh yeah, I had a Mario 64 sealed that you know I bought for someone or I had and never opened it." Oh, absolutely. That's happened with NES games. There was that Kid Icarus seal we talked about last yeah. year. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and, a, and a sealed Mario 64 is it's a hell of a lot harder, excuse me, more easier to find than a Kid Icarus sealed. So there you have it. Anything else? Are we good on this? We're good.